All right, folks, we've made it to the implementation step. This first task, task I1, is control implementation. Implement the controls in the security and privacy plans. That's the task we're about to take on in task I1. Potential inputs for this task include the approved security and privacy plans, system design documents, organizational security and privacy policies and procedures, business impact or criticality analysis, enterprise architecture information, security architecture information, privacy architecture information, a list of security and privacy requirements allocated to the system, system elements, and environment of operation. The system element information, the system component inventory, and finally, organization and system level risk assessment results. The outputs for this task are easy. It's going to be the implemented controls. Primary responsibility for this task is the system owner or the common control provider. Folks supporting this task, the supporting roles, are the information owner or steward, the security architect, the privacy architect, the system security engineer, the privacy engineer, the system security officer, the system privacy officer, the enterprise architect, and the system administrator. A bunch of people help out on this task. This does align with the SDLC. For a new system, it aligns with development, acquisition, or implementation and assessment. An existing system, it aligns with operations and maintenance. It also aligns with the cybersecurity framework. It aligns with PR, IP1, information protection processes and procedures, a baseline configuration of information technology or industrial control systems is created and maintained incorporating security principles, for example, the concept of least functionality, as well as PRIP2, information protection processes and procedures, a system development lifecycle to manage systems is implemented. Let's jump into the task. Organizations implement the controls as described in the security and privacy plans. The control implementation is consistent with the organization's enterprise architecture and associated security and privacy architectures. So when we designed the plan for implementing our control in the earlier step, we determined how we planned on doing the control implementation. Now we're going to go ahead and implement the control as we planned it in those documents. And the documents being the security plan or the privacy plan or the combined security and privacy plan. We want to make sure that the control is implemented consistent with the enterprise architecture and the security and privacy architectures. That means we want to make sure the control fits in with the other things already in those architectures. Organizations use best practices when implementing controls, including system security and privacy engineering methodologies, concepts, and principles. And we can provide references to those, but you want to use methodologies that support the controls while you're implementing them in the system you're developing. Risk assessments guide and inform decisions regarding the cost, benefit, risk trade-offs in using different technologies or policies for control implementation. We always want to watch the bottom line. There's a balance between the cost of implementing a security control or privacy control and the benefit we get from implementing that security or privacy control. So this is where the risk assessment comes in. It determines the value of implementing a control or the risk and value of not implementing a control or partially implementing it. So we use the risk assessment to determine that value. Organizations also ensure that mandatory configuration settings are established and implemented on system elements in accordance with federal and organizational policies. So we want to make sure we're meeting the requirements of federal and organizational requirements. These are going to be laid out in advance, so it's not a mystery. So we want to make sure we put those configurations in place. For example, if our organization says the password for systems has to be 12 characters long, that's a mandatory configuration setting. We need to make sure that that mandatory configuration setting is in place when we put the controls in our system. And of course, this goes over a number of other 
requirements and configuration settings that are established by our organization, federal law, or other requirements we have to follow. When organizations have no direct control over what controls are implemented in a system element, for example, in a commercial off-the-shelf product, organizations consider the use of system elements that have been tested, evaluated, or validated by an approved independent third-party assessment facility, for example, NIST cryptographic module validation program testing laboratories, or the National Information Assurance Partnership Common Criteria Testing Laboratories. So there are some components or system elements that may be included in the system we're building that we don't have direct control over implementing those required controls in. I know that's a lot of controls in one state, statement. But in the cases where we're implementing a component that we don't have direct control over, we try to find a product that has been evaluated by a trusted third party. That could be common criteria, it could be NIST, it could be some other laboratory that has evaluated that component. So we have assurance that when we implement it, it's providing the correct level of protection. The test and evaluations and validations consider products in specific configurations and also in isolation. Control implementation addresses how the product is integrated into the system while preserving the security functionality and assurance. So when we look at the component or when we're looking at the results from a lab that has conducted an assessment, we want to look at the product both in isolation, the product by itself, and then also the product with a specific configuration as we're implementing it in our system. This helps preserve the security functionality and the assurance level that we're required to have. Organizations also address, where applicable, the assurance requirements when implementing controls. Now it's important to know what an assurance requirement is. Assurance requirements are directed at the activities that the control developers and implementers carry out to increase the level of confidence that the control is implemented correctly, operating as intended, and producing the desired outcome with respect to meeting the security and privacy requirements for the system. The assurance requirements address quality of design, development, and implementation of the control. So when we're talking about assurance, we're having an assurance that the control is working as it's designed. It's implemented correctly. It's providing the right level of control. And when it does provide an output, that output is correct and reliable. For common controls inherited by the system, the system security and privacy engineers with support from security and privacy officers coordinate with the common control provider to determine the most appropriate way to implement common controls. The system owners can refer to the authorization packages prepared by the common control providers when making determinations requiring the adequacy of the common controls inherited by their systems. So when we're implementing common controls, when we're inheriting those controls, we don't just have to do it blindly. We want to look at the documentation in the authorization package prepared by those common control providers and determine the level of protection that those common controls will provide. It's one of the important things we do as a security or a privacy officer is to review the common controls and ensure that they're providing the correct level of protection required for our system and the data we'll be processing. During implementation, it may be determined that common controls previously selected to be inherited by the system do not meet the specified security or privacy requirements for the system. For common controls that do not meet the requirements for the system inheriting the controls or when the common controls have unacceptable deficiency, the system owners identify compensating or supplementary controls to be implemented. System owners can supplement the common controls with system-specific or hybrid controls to achieve the required protection for their system, or they can accept the greater risk with acknowledgement and approval of the organization. 
So when we look at those common controls and we determine the level of protection they're providing, we can identify those controls that don't meet the requirements for the system we're building or the data we're processing. And in those cases, we can add compensating or supplementary controls to make the system stronger, or we can take that common control and implement it stronger or more stringently at the system level or add enhancements to that control to make it a hybrid control. Risk assessments may determine how gaps in security or privacy requirements between systems and common controls affect the risks associated with the system and how to prioritize the need for compensating or supplementary controls to mitigate specific risks. And this is what we do when we did tailoring. We looked at the controls and we determined if we needed to apply additional controls to close any security or privacy gaps. That's what we're doing here. We're adding compensating or supplementary controls to mitigate those risks we've uncovered when we determine there's an additional gap. Consistency with the flexibility allowed in applying the task in the RMF, organizations conduct initial control assessments during system development and implementation. Conducting such assessments in parallel with the development and implementation phase of the SDLC facilitates early identifications of deficiencies and provides a cost-effective method for initiating corrective actions. So this means we're going to test the controls as we're developing them. We can do this as a self-assessment, or if we have the resources, we can have an independent control assessor look at the controls as we assess them. The big point is, if we are assessing them during the implementation, then we can quickly correct any deficiencies that are uncovered because we have the people that understand the system component we're working on and they can quickly make corrections that meet the requirements of the control. Issues discovered during these assessments can be referred to the authorizing official for resolution. The results of the initial control assessments can also be used during the authorized step to avoid delays or costly duplication of assessments. Assessment results that are subsequently reused in other phases of the SDLC meet the reuse requirements established by the organization. Normally, this means that we can reuse the test procedures that were used to conduct the initial assessment if the assessment was conducted as a self-assessment and not by an independent control assessor. If, however, the control was assessed by an independent control assessor early in the SDLC, those results can essentially be reused in most cases. And that's due to the fact that the control assessment was conducted by an independent assessor, and that's important. References for this task include FIPS 200, Special Publications 830, 53, 53 Alpha, 160 Volume 1, 161, and IR 8062 and IR 8179. In this task, we covered a lot of things. We talked about task I1, its inputs and outputs, roles and responsibility, the SDLC and CSF lifecycle alignment, implementation and security plan, best practices, risk assessments, mandatory configurations, lack of direct control, configuration and isolation, assurance requirements, common controls, hybrid controls, implementation gaps, consistency and flexibility, resolution, and finally, the references. It's a lot to cover in one task. If any of this doesn't make sense to you, go back and watch that portion again. But if it does make sense, go off to the next video, or if you're taking the lesson, continue with the lesson material.